My name is Aaron Rutkoff. I'm from New York, and I'm the editor of Bloomberg Green. Uh, first, I want to thank John Micklethwaite and John Farr for giving me the chance to create a new kind of publication at Bloomberg, uh, and to do so by remaking and disrupting the very template of our digital journalism, and in a way that I think uh, tries to absorb uh, some very important lessons from uh, the way that the Bloomberg terminal has always told news stories. Um, I realized during uh, the months that we were working on this product that what we were essentially making was a kind of scoreboard for all of humanity. Uh, you can see it there on the left side of our stories. It's called the data dashboard. Uh, to build this, we would be putting key climate metrics inside of all of the climate news that we did from now on. Uh, we got to kind of invade the story template with key numbers that we wanted people to see to understand what was going on in climate. Um, so we're making data uh, visceral and available and accessible, which is what the terminal has always done. Um, but it's something that I think has been more difficult to achieve with climate news. And as you can see, the, when, the, when you enter the dashboard, you can click on any of those metrics and it takes you into a deeper data experience that offers an explanation for why this number is important in the climate story, how we, uh, how we know this information, how we built this number, and what progress would look like. Uh, so you take a metric like tree loss, which is something that we read about all the time in climate stories. Um, the numbers are big. It's 7,000 meters of tree cover that we lose every second. Uh, in a year, you can size that up, and it's the size of the United Kingdom. But in real time, it's hard to get a sense of what that's like. So we created a visualization that allows you to experience it in a more visceral way. Uh, again, this is something that I think is one of the tricks you learn working at Bloomberg. We have metrics inside of all of our stories, whether it's the performance of the S&P 500, interest rates or the ticker symbols for companies. So the trick was for us to make something similar for climate news. Um, this is our carbon clock. This is one of the metrics that you see. It's now sort of the uh, calling card for this product. You see it on the landing page for Bloomberg Green, bloomberggreen.com, and you can click into it and see it here. This shows you in real time uh, the, the reason why we're all concerned about climate change, carbon dioxide pollution from humans. Uh, I think this is a familiar number for everybody. Uh, parts per million, it's a heat trapping gas. It goes up over modern history, but it doesn't only go up. Uh, so this number tells us that it now makes up about uh, zero, zero, uh, 0.0414 uh, percent, one three today, of uh, the overall atmospheric volume. Um, and that's almost 50 percent higher than before industrialization. Uh, the last time carbon count was this high, it was three million years ago, and the planet was two to three degrees Celsius warmer, and the ocean level was about 65 feet higher. Uh, but what makes the carbon clock interesting is when, when you're on the live website and not this uh, video, it constantly ticks and moves. And again, that mirrors our experience of financial data. And it doesn't only go up, it's a, it's a metric that has a seasonal adjustment, so it moves up and down, which again creates a visceral experience for readers of climate change happening in real time, which I think is what we are trying to do with our journalism. Um, this is our global temperature change metric. Uh, it's also part of the dashboard. Uh, I had the eerie experience while working on this one of uh, seeing the temperature rise, which again is something we all know, right? It's a, it's a part of why we're all here, uh, but it, this number had been locked for the weeks that I was working on this month at uh, 0 0.9 degrees Celsius, and it becomes something that you tick into all of the stories that you edit on climate change. Uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of standard line, uh, nearly one degree of warming out of the Paris Agreement goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. But then all of a sudden it ticks up to 1.1 degrees, and you think possibly there's an error. I asked the data team that was building this if something had gone wrong because the number had been set in place for so long, but no, it was just that we got new data and the tool worked, and so the number rose. Um, this is our Arctic sea ice metric. Uh, this is actually part of the origin of the project. Uh, one of the data viz people who worked on this with me uh, came to me excitedly asking if we could do something that can make people understand Arctic sea ice extent, which is part of the everyday language of science in terms of understanding climate change. But when you go to the NASA website uh, that explains uh, sea ice extent, it's baffling. So what we did here is create a, a metric for understanding how it works. The, the gray lines that you see are uh, the Arctic sea ice level going back to 1979, and the green line shows you where ours is today. Low is bad. That means we are uh, less ice than before, and we turn the number into a percentage, and we put it in our dashboard. Um, this is our air pollution metric. To 
build this one, uh, we used a network of 4,000 air quality sensors all over the world that are part of an open source network. We can tell readers each day uh, which is the most polluted, uh, polluted air city in the world. We can also let them explore the entire network to see uh, air quality every day in different places. Uh, this typically will show a city in India or China each day, but while making this last week, we noticed that Sarajevo was that day's most polluted uh, city. Um, and again, that's the kind of thing that was a surprising result, and it's something you can only see by making this data transparent and inside of our stories. Um, now, part of the emphasis of Bloomberg Green is on telling stories about solution, and this is what the real-time power metrics uh, helps us do. Um, this is actually something quite exceptional. We were able to uh, gather data on four markets, Brazil, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And this shows you, as of the last hour, uh, what the energy mix is in, inside of the national power grid. So you can see that on January 17th, when I pulled this data, Brazil was at 86%. Yesterday, it was about the same. It was 85%. The United States power grid was at 36% renewable energy. Uh, the United Kingdom was at 25%, and Germany was at 35%. Uh, this is basically the way that we can tell the story to zero emissions. It starts here with the energy sources used by major nations to provide electricity. Um, 30 years ago, more than half of power generation came from coal and natural gas, and 30 years from now, the same proportion is gonna come from sun and wind. And uh, you know, one, one thing was, why did we pick these four countries? It was because we had the data and we could build this tool this way. Um, but this is a useful bellwether for the goal, which has been declared now by several nations, of reaching zero emissions by 2050, uh, which is coincidentally when power demand from developing nations is expected to double from today's level. Uh, another way that we can monitor solutions is by looking at renewable capacity investment. Uh, this is the ultimate indicator of progress. Uh, we have numbers for renewable investment broken down by nation. If you uh, were to mouse over this chart, you'd be able to see each nation identified and their proportion of uh, its contribution to the global total of renewable investment. This goes back to 2004. Uh, we drew this number from our uh, colleagues at Bloomberg NEF. Uh, whose researchers and analysts are truly amazing. Uh, so this past quarter, we were at almost $82 billion of re uh, renewable capacity investment worldwide. Um, last year, the world financed $282 billion of renewable capacity, mostly in wind and solar. Um, it, it already dwarfs, renewable investment already dwarfs the estimated $100 billion of new finance for uh, coal and gas power in 2019. So. Um, this is the tool that we've spent the last several months building, and it's part of a daily website experience where you can see parts of the data dashboard now surfaced in, in bloomberggreen.com. Um, we're also introduced, as of yesterday, a daily newsletter that you can sign up for uh, that provides a news brief and uh, allows you to experience the voice and the thoughts of uh, core climate reporters who are part of our team, covering everything from green finance to climate science to zero emission technology uh, and the energy transition. Uh, we're going to have a live event later this year. Uh, there's going to be podcasts. There's going to be integration with Bloomberg TV and streaming video. And uh, we're going to work to put together a magazine that will come out in April. Um, I think this is a way to build something that people can hold on to of our climate journalism. Um, and I hope we're going to show what the uh, kind of work we're going to do will show the difference that a Bloomberg climate approach will make. Thank you very much.